Welcome listeners to the Stories, Fables, Ghostly Tales podcast and today I'm continuing the last episode's story, Michi's Journey Part 5, Act 1. As a side note, I hope your weather is faring much better than mine. It's cloudy over here and at the point where I can see the clouds coming, feeling the cold and can tell it's gonna rain. I'm sort of looking forward to it and sort of not. Nothing like rain on the roof, just not whilst I'm recording. (laughs) Before I jump into today's original story, I want to read out the top three messages I received yesterday around how listeners would respond if their world was full of yokai. My first listener says, I'd be a scientist trying to figure out where they came from. That's pretty cool. My next one is, I'd be the yokai. (laughs) That's fantastic. And lastly, possibly the strangest, I'd want to be a fish so I could not think about anything. Don't we all want to be a fish deep down? (laughs) This is why I love my listeners. (laughs) Okay, turn those lights off, the sound up, and get ready for an original. Michi was startled by some rustling in the brush when a young woman stumbled out in a ripped kimono. Her dark brown hair had clumps of dirt, twigs, and leaves. The woman was at least 16. Her skin was fair with red scratches on her arms and legs. A small trail of dried blood ran down the inside of her thigh. Upon seeing Michi, she rushed to his side, bawling her eyes out. Please, monk, protect me. She clenched his kimono sleeve and slightly hid behind him. A new set of rustling came from the same direction as three Kotengu emerged from the trees. Give us the girl! They shouted in unison. Michi decided he needed to use all his swordsmanship to be able to defeat these guys. Kek! Michi said as a barrier erupted, locking the girl inside his protective shield. If I should fall unconscious, miss, run and run fast. His voice deepened with the last four words. Michi needed both his sheath and his sword for this fight. He untied his sheath and held it in his left hand, his right hand firmly holding the handle of his katana. You will never harm another human again, as long as I'm standing. Michi said as he held a drawing stance just waiting for the attack from the three beasts. Each beast had a distinct hair color. The one directly in front of him had gray hair. The one to his five o'clock had brown and the one to his seven o'clock had black. The grey-haired one spoke first. Well, well, well. What do we have here? Something better than a used girl? The grotesque beak opened and his tongue made its way around the edge of his beak as if licking its lips. She is soiled now and no longer tasty, but a little monk like you Its eyes rolled into the back of its head, and it shuddered, as if just thinking about it brought this creature great pleasure. I will dine on your innards and ascend. The beast made a lunge for Michi with its claws, extending his grey wings, beating them in the air, and he called as loud as he could. The other two decided to follow his lead and lunged as well, hoping to prevent the monk from moving. Michi anticipated this move and drew his katana. The blade came across the grey-haired one's chest, slicing into it horizontally. After the blade made it to the final stopping point of its swing, Michi wasn't done, as he let go of the katana's handle for a split second and changed his grip, allowing him to pull back the blade again against his forearm, blocking the brown-haired one's attack cleanly and his sheath made a similar block on his opponent's arm. Really? He said, staring at the beast with the silver hair. (sighs) The beast shouted, clenching its chest. Michi wasted no time as he spun around counterclockwise, cutting the right hand off the brown-haired one. (sighs) Really? He muttered as he came around. The black-haired one was deflected and turned around. Then, Michi brought his blade across the creature's back. (sighs) Really? Really? All three brushed off their injuries and rushed in again this time. Michi evaded by ducking under the Grey One's attacks and making a rising arc with his sword slicing over the horizontal cut. Pyo. 
he stated, as his sheath made contact with the elbow of the black-haired one, making the sound of a revolting snap as the arm went limp. He spun on the ground, extending a leg out and aimed for the brown one's legs, causing him to fall. His injured hand flew up into the air trying to prevent further injury. Michi made a swift vertical slash from in between the beast's index and middle finger to the wrist. Pyo, he muttered as he stood and spun around to the black-haired one, making another cut vertically across its back. Pyo, Michi could feel his stamina reducing, his breath was heavy, and his heart felt like it was about to explode in his chest. But he had to push through this. The Kotengu took to the sky to try and prevent Michi from attacking them. What do we do, brothers? The black-haired one spoke, holding its broken arm. The three conversed in the air out of Michi's range of hearing. Kek? Michi decided he was going to try something new with his Kekai. As he swung his sword, he imagined what the blade of the katana looked like and shaped his Kekai to extend the blade. The horrible sound of metal through flesh sounded, and he saw he had hit the black-haired one on the back with another horizontal strike. <laughs> Six small blue specks showed up on the fresh wound of the monster's back, making it look grid-like. Michi made the cuts with his fingers. You could watch the Kekai balls run, making fresh cuts into the demon's skin. The beast screamed in pain and agony as Michi carved his back with the symbols of his demise. Please, stop! You can't do this to me! You can't! It screamed desperately before the last syllable was uttered. The beast's back began to glow with a bright light, and before long the whole beast was sucked into the symbol like a planet into a black hole. The remaining two, still believing in their numbers, rushed in to avenge their fallen brother. We, we will, will end, end you. you! They screamed together as they rushed Michi. Unbeknown to Michi, another figure approached his Kakai. This one being more human, with a long phallic nose and red skin wearing monk robes. The figure placed a hand on the Kakai and made a small opening. It reached in and placed a hand on the girl that began to glow with a soft pink light that put the girl to sleep. It dragged her out and into the undergrowth before using its pointed nails to pierce her heart. It licked its bloodied hands, which transformed it into a spitting image of the girl. The figure, now disguised as the girl, took her place in the Kakai and waited. For Michi, the fight wasn't over. Michi had blocked the brown haired one's attack with the blade, making another horizontal cut. Tom. Michi parried the grey haired one to the side, making him crash into the ground. He then pushed the blade as hard as he could, tossing the brown haired one backwards. This time, he charged the down monster and stepped on its hand and made the remaining cuts all while yelling, Shakai Jin Ritsu Gai Zen. Once again, the monster twisted and contorted as it was sucked into the glowing wound and disappeared. Upon seeing two Kotengu being slain, the grey haired one ran away, screaming for help. Michi sighed heavily and sat down, dispelling his Kekai. The woman ran over to his side and hugged the young monk. Her breasts, pushing against his face, almost becoming uncovered in the process. Michi grabbed the edges of her tattered kimono and made sure she was amply covered before looking at her. Are you okay, miss? He asked, slightly winded from the battle. The young woman looked away as she realized she was exposing too much to her monk, and she answered, Yes, I am fine. Thank you. With that, she stood up and said, I know a place we can rest as the mountain will get dangerous as night falls. Saying so with a slight smirk, Michi gathered his pack and decided as long as they could get out of the elements, then they would be in a better standing. Michi followed behind the young woman as she led him deeper into the woods. How many Tengu live on this mountain? Michi thought to himself as he followed the girl. I have to be careful since their main form of enjoyment comes from killing, eating or raping humans and monks are even more of a prize. Michi's inner thoughts had distracted him so much he didn't realize they had made it to a path and a small house was in sight. 
the young woman spoke up. This is my family's hunting house. My brothers and father use it when they are out late hunting and don't want a chance walking back to the village. She opened the door, and the place smelt stuffy. But Michu was neither a beggar nor a chooser, and as the sun was setting and his options were outside or in this house, he chose the latter. Michu gathered some firewood from the stack outside and built a fire in the aiori. He fanned the flames till the room was comfortable, and he could make some green tea for the both of them. Michi felt the presence of magic all around the house, but he assumed it was due to being on a mountain controlled by Tengu. So he placed some ceiling talismans on all the potential entrances and made small talk with the woman while he tried to recharge from the fight. Hours later, the young woman stretched and lay down. Let's get some sleep and go to the village in the morning. Michi, feeling confident no monster could get in, stretched out and laid down. Not an hour later, he felt the warmth of the girl's hands on his chest, and he couldn't move. What, what the, the hell? hell? He asked in his own mind as he tried to move his arms, but couldn't. He felt the top half of his robes. Slip from his shoulders, and he was rolled on his side. He felt a warm embrace as the young woman's hands came to his chest, and he felt her bare chest pressed against his back. This is inappropriate for you to do with a monk, he stated as he felt her kiss the back of his neck. She responded by whispering in his ear, "I'm repaying you." For the heroic deed earlier. One hand stayed on his chest, and the other slid further down, resting on his abdomen. This is the only thing I can repay you with. She cooed in his ear as she pressed her body against his, making it apparent she was talking about her body. Michi stammered and struggled to break free from the paralysis. I, I can't do this. I don't need to be repaid. He was panicking as the girl reached underneath his bottoms. As the girl reached underneath, a white light erupted, and he was able to move. He knew this could only happen one way. That was if there was an illusionary spell in play. Damn it! When did you get hold of her? Michi asked as the monk clad Daitengu stood up, his phallic nose protruding and his red face laughing. <laughs> oh, when you were fighting my brothers, I snuck into the Kekai and killed the girl, taking her place. If I could make you break your vow of celibacy, I could gain your spiritual power. He slapped his knee to punctuate his lost opportunity. Now that the jig is up, I'll have to eat you. But I'll admit it was clever to place a dispelling charm under your clothes. You caught me off guard. Michi gritted his teeth and charged the monster. Letting its long nose slip between his middle and ring finger till he grabbed its face, and with all his rage, he pushed the thing towards the door, head first. <laughs> the ceiling charm erupted into an electrical burst, causing the man's head to frizzle as well as his beard. The charm gave, and so did the door. Michi and the man came crashing to the ground. You damn monsters! I will end you," he yelled as he struck his opponent's face with brutal punches, causing one of its teeth to dislodge and the nose to continuously be broken and bent with each blow. Michi felt slightly better, but this was not a path to enlightenment, and the Tengu knew it. After the initial onslaught from Michi, the Tengu flapped its huge wings, launching Michi into the trees. I tire of this, boy. Bring everything you've got. The tango flapped its wings, raising it into the air, and two tornadoes touched down, ripping up whole trees by the roots. And a lightning bolt struck feet from Michi. I'm scared. Michi thought to himself for the first time since his first yokai fight. His thoughts didn't have time to register before a gale whisked him into one of the tornadoes. The wind forced him upwards, turning him into a rag doll to be pelted by small debris. 
One large tree limb slammed against his side with a deafening crack, and a small yelp escaped his lips. He knew at least a single rib was broken, but this didn't stop Michi. He continued to be thrown left to right, up and down, almost disorientating him. Must do something fast, or I'm a dead man. He thought as he quickly yelled, Kek. He slammed against his thin Kekai. With the help of the wind pinning him down, Kek. He created a platform to stand on, and two more to block a good portion of the wind. He knew if a full grown tree hit one of them, they would shatter, and he would have to move fast, as he didn't have much time. Kek. He yelled as the one in front of him extended outside of the tornado and was wide open to the side closest to him. He jumped inside and could see the Daitengu on the opposite side. Michi could feel the air pressure rising inside the tube. With a swipe of his fingers down the closed end outside the tornado, it opened and Michi was expelled from the structure at incredible speed right at the Daitengu. Michi brandished his sword and muttered, Jokasuru, making his blade glow a bright white before beheading the Daitengu. Once decapitated, the beast dissolved into salt. The tornado died down and the residual wind carried the salt across the mountain. Michi was still very much in danger as he did not know where he would land or if he could land safely. He formulated a plan as he saw a lake nearby. Kek. A long kikai formed with a gradual slope down into the water. Michi did a front flip before entering his structure, making sure to land on his clothed legs to reduce the friction to his skin as he slid to safety. He was still traveling at incredible speed for that time. When he hit the water's surface, he skipped a couple of times across before sinking into the shallow depths at the edge. After swimming to the shore and pulling himself out shirtless and soaked, he breathed a sigh of relief. That was all too deserved. But the relief was short lived. And this draws Act 2 of Michi's Journey Part 5 to an end. Next episode is Act 3, and Carl Brandt will take us down another turn that I guarantee you won't expect. Now, you brilliant listeners, I hope you have a fantastic weekend, and that you have loads of fun and get a chance to relax. Also, if you find the time to chat to any family or friends, and they have some stories you think you'd love to have narrated with sound effects, feel free to email me. If you want to make it even easier, you can swing by my website, and you can send me your stories in the contact form at the bottom of the page. Next week, I'll be finishing off Michi's Journey Part 5, which has a fantastically unique ending, plus author notes, which I always love, and I've been given some excellent no-sleep stories directly by the author themselves, and some short scary stories that will blow your socks off, So yes, next week is a big week, and I hope you can join me then. Have a great weekend, my creepy guys and gals. And on that note, it is that time. This is the place where stories live, and you telltellers come to listen. Enjoy your day or night, and join me every weekday for our creepy tradition. And as always, till next time.